Great. Good afternoon. My name is Brent Orell, and I'm a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute where I study workforce development policy. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to our book event on system error, where big tech went wrong and how we can reboot with two of the book's authors, Dr. Robert Reich and Dr. Jeremy Weinstein of Stanford University. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Mirren uh, Sahami, who had wanted to be with us here today, was detained by his work uh, in uh, Palo Alto and is unable to join us. Um, framing around this issue and why we're here is extremely important. Why is AEI interested in AI? To begin answering that, um, let me read you our mission statement. The American Enterprise Institute is a public policy think tank dedicated to defending human dignity, expanding human potential, and building a freer and safer world. The work of our scholars and staff advances ideas rooted in our belief in democracy, free enterprise, American strength and global leadership, solidarity with those at the periphery of our society, and a pluralistic entrepreneurial culture. As a general purpose technology that is likely to affect all aspects of our lives and relationships with one another as people and as nations, AI touches every strand of the AEI mission. Defending human dignity, check. Expanding human potential, also check. Building a freer and safer world, yes. AI has clear implications for democratic institutions, free enterprise, and maintaining America's role in the world as the main global pillar defending democracy and human rights. Low income and disadvantaged populations perhaps have the most to hope from AI, in my view, as well as much to worry about. We are concerned with maintaining an open, pluralistic public square and see vast potential for good and ill in how AI could affect public dialogue. And of course, the potential of AI adding trillions of dollars of value to our economy means we have an intense interest in maintaining an open, competitive, and entrepreneurial AI ecosystem. Our topic today is incredibly timely. Uh, the public release of chat GPT-3 earlier this year and followed by GPT-4 uh, has caused multiple frenzies of both hope and, in some cases, despair. Uh, President Biden and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer are pressing hard to construct new regulatory structures to manage AI risk. The public dialogue around this topic appears, uh, as with so many other issues, to be polarizing, but not between progressives and populists or Republicans and Democrats, but mainly between techno-optimists and pessimists between those who look at AI and see the enormous potential it has to solve problems, improve health and increase prosperity, and those who see a different potential, a world in which human beings are sidelined by machines and in the worst case might be hurt or destroyed by them. We want to foster a difficult, a different, I should say, dialogue here today. AI will not deliver uh, on the millennial hope, millennial hopes of some, nor is it likely to cause an apocalypse as others fear. We are intelligent, adaptable creatures. We've gotten through challenging transitions in the past, and we can do the same with AI. But there are bugs, and sometimes even features of AI, that require scrutiny and planning to help bring, a, uh, bring about the best while mitigating potential dangers. Our speakers are going to help us understand more clearly what they see as some of the key challenges in AI, in AI development, uh, including some of the challenges in its underlying assumptions about progress and humanity, amplification of undesirable aspects of economy and the way that they might uh, amplify undesirable aspects of our economy, society, politics, and culture. Robert Reich is a professor of political science at Stanford who also holds an appointment with the Department of Philosophy and is one of seven associate directors of the Stanford Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence uh, Project. Jeremy Weinstein is a professor of political science and a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies 
as well as the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. For our program today, um, this is the run of show, uh, Rob and Jeremy are going to do a bit of a tag team uh, talking through the main themes of system error uh, before we turn to a conversation that will be facilitated by uh, Shane Tooze, who is, our, uh, is an AEI senior fellow and the leader of AEI's technology policy team, um, and myself. Uh, following that, we'll turn to questions from our in-person audience and, and our virtual audiences. Uh, if you're watching online, please direct uh, questions via Twitter uh, to the hashtag AEI system error, or by email to my research assistant, Hunter Dixon, at hunter.dixon at aei.org. Uh, one final note, uh, you will notice at the front of the room the table um, with the wonderful copies of the free book, which you are encouraged to take at no charge uh, at the end of, of the uh, session. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob and Jeremy um, to walk us through system error. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming out uh, today. I'm Jeremy, and I'm the political scientist, social scientist of the writing team. This is Rob, uh, my colleague, who, as introduced, is a political philosopher. And our third co-author is uh, Maron Sahami, who's a computer scientist. And together, we've been engaged in an effort on campus at Stanford over the last many years to really think about how we prepare and educate computer scientists, in particular, in the next generation to navigate the really complex ethical and policy issues they confront as they build and design new technologies. In that sense, sometimes when we come to Washington, I feel like we're coming from a planet far away. We're drinking the water of Silicon Valley. We're living the reality of a world that has been focused on large language models long before Washington, D.C. discovered what they were. Um, and while I knew the uniform to wear when I come to Washington, the only thing I'm missing is my badge, uh, Rob, Rob didn't bring his tie, but I knew when I come back to Washington, uh, I needed to bring my tie. And, and part of the way that I want to open the story from my perspective is that I've spent most of my career working on issues of foreign policy. Uh, I served in the Obama administration on the White House National Security Council in the second term. I was the deputy ambassador to the United Nations. And it was in that role uh, where I saw in all sorts of powerful ways how new technologies were transforming the policy landscape uh, in a way that government was wholly unprepared to address. This came up, of course, around issues of encryption uh, and the balance between privacy and security that was very much an issue that was at the top of the agenda uh, during the Obama administration. The first set of cyber attacks on major private sector companies uh, were also something that we experienced uh, when I was at the White House and on the Deputies Committee. And so when I finished up my service in government and went back to Stanford, I was thinking, well, what's my role in thinking about this set of frontier policy challenges we're likely to confront? And then when I got back to Stanford, I'd been gone for many years during the Obama administration, I found this, which was a campus that had been absolutely transformed by the growth of computer science as a major and a discipline. We had gone from you know, about 100 majors a year in computer science to 350, the largest major for men, the largest major for women. A campus that previously had a real diversity of fields of study narrowing down exclusively on this emergent discipline of computer science. And at that time, we had headlines like this in The New Yorker, if you want to go and get rich, you go to Get Rich University. That's in Silicon Valley, the paved pathway from a Stanford education straight up to Sand Hill Road to get your VC funding and then to start your startup company. And of course, when I got back, we were at a moment when tech utopianism and tech optimism was being replaced by a set of concerns about the potential harms and consequences of new technologies. We'd had the 2016 election campaign, concerns about the pollution of the information ecosystem, concerns about concentrated tech power. And so Rob and Maron and I came together and said, at this moment in time, when we're equipping students with these extraordinary superpowers of the 21st century, 
How do we cultivate a mindset among young technologists that helps them to navigate the challenges that are being created by the technologies that they're building? And so the book is a story from our perspective of the kind of interdisciplinary mindset that's necessary to manage the challenges of this new technological frontier that we're at, and also to amplify those benefits that Brent spoke about at the outset. How should technologists approach their work and how should policymakers think about their relationship with the tech sector? And so we're gonna walk you through a bit of the outline of the book to get the conversation started, and then we'll dig into some of the details of the tech policy conversations of the moment. So the book opens with a set of stories, and these stories capture what we think was one of the particular pathologies of the culture on campus at Stanford when we started doing this work. Um, and so we tell the story of Josh Browder. Josh Browder was a Stanford undergraduate. He arrived as an 18-year-old. He developed skills as a computer scientist. And very quickly, he had an intuition that he ought to drop out of Stanford like many successful founders had done before and start a company. And he had a pretty simple problem that he wanted to solve. When he was a 17-year-old living in London, uh, he got a bunch of parking tickets. And those parking tickets were incredibly annoying um, because they led to large fines that he needed to pay. And he wasn't yet in a place in his life where he was earning money. Uh, and so he didn't want to pay those parking tickets. So he raised, uh, first, the first thing he did was he built a bot that could basically get you out of parking tickets. It would learn from interaction with government service providers what are the best answers to give to particular questions, and then it would automatically file a form on your behalf and get you out of having to pay a parking ticket. And he called this app Do Not Pay, um, and he offered up Do Not Pay as the kind of technology and tool that can get you out of all sorts of really annoying situations that you may, might find yourself in. And he was able to raise a round of venture capital. I think the first round was $7 million or something uh, from Sand Hill Road as a 19-year-old. And he dropped out. And one of the challenges, one of the reasons that we start with this story is, and, and we've brought Josh Browder to class, we engage with him in hearty debate on a regular basis, but Josh Browder wasn't asking some basic questions that we think technologists who are building products ought to ask on a regular basis, like, why do we have parking tickets? What is the function served by parking tickets in society? Uh, I assume many of you live in DC. There's street cleaning that happens in DC. You have that annoying moment every week where you need to get up early and you need to move your car to the other side and maybe there aren't enough spaces in DuPont Circle or Adams Morgan, wherever you're living. We have handicapped spaces and we preserve spaces for people who are disabled for a reason. In some places, parking tickets are used to manage congestion right, and are part of a strategy for reducing congestion and emissions. So, and in the UK, parking tickets are actually used to finance uh, the maintenance of roads. Um, so they're a central revenue raising strategy for government. So there are all sorts of reasons that parking tickets exist, uh, but Josh Browder wasn't focused on those reasons. He was focused on getting himself out of parking tickets because that was a pain point for him as an individual. And it speaks to some of the trade-offs that are involved in designing new technologies. Now, Josh Browder's version doesn't stop with parking tickets because Josh Browder's amb ambition is to replace lawyers, to, embrace, um, to replace the legal sector, to use automated tools to negotiate divorces, to figure out how to use automated tools to manage the difficult challenge of uh, custody of children when couples separate. So a very ambitious vision about replacing an entire sector of our society with a bot. And we use the parking ticket example to say, look, there's a lot more complexity than building the tool here. And the question is, how do we weigh the kind of value trade-offs that are inherent in new technologies as they're built? All right, well, this is a story that goes back at least four or five years, and I want to, at least in the initial framing, before I then give you a sense of the contents of the book, sort of bring us up to date. Uh, I used ChatGPT a few uh, weeks ago to ask the question, should AI have professional norms? And you get this, you know, sort of on the one hand, on the other hand sort of answer. And these days, when you think about ChatGPT, Chat um, you think about all the 
productivity boosts it might bring you in any number of different domains. But if, if you're educators like us, you also think about the ways in which it can be used by students in classrooms to cheat. Um, for the first time in the past six months, nearly every professor, nearly every middle school and high school teacher that I know had to craft a policy about the use of language tools in the completion of assignments. And you know, since the release of ChatGPT just in November 2022, the shift in the marketplace from it being a product, excuse me, a research lab orientation to a product lab orientation, you've got companies like Paragraph AI, which are using these base models, these foundation models, um, to try not merely to offer up writing resources that would be used for, say, people like you in a, in a think tank, in a, in a research institute, to supplement your already developed writing skills and judgment, but catnip for eighth graders writing their essay on whatever it turns out to be, um, a replacement for human judgment rather than a supplement uh, for human judgment. This is the sense in which the frame in the book that we use from do not pay all the way up to chat GPT is that the rapid development and deployment and release of technology, digital technology, has created a set of negative externalities. Uh, in this particular case with ChatGPT, the decision to release it dumped upon the backs of teachers across the world the responsibility of trying to figure out how to diminish the negative use case of cheating. Um, it could have been the case that the really talented people at OpenAI, as they are now doing, could have released the tool with watermarking or various forms of authentication and provenance built into the technology. But they didn't, they put it out there, and it was the problem for every instructor across the world to figure out what to do with these negative externalities. So that idea of negative externalities is then something that came up in the hearings that happened just recently with Sam Altman, the CEO of Do Not Pay, excuse me, not of Do Not Pay, of OpenAI. And um, we're now at a moment in which I think it's fair to say a policy window is opening finally in the United States after 30 or 40 years of a kind of deliberate orientation to have a policy oasis around Silicon Valley, a policy oasis around um, the development of technology so that America could win the race initially to pave the super, super information superhighway. This policy window that's just opening is the moment we find ourselves in. The release just yesterday of Senator Schumer's AI framework. Um, I happen to find myself an extraordinary honor and privilege to be in conversation with President Biden in San Francisco on Tuesday afternoon, two days ago. Um, things are beginning to ferment here, and now the idea of confronting some of the negative consequences of, of technology is on the front burner. This frame, the idea of externalities, will seem to people here at AEI, I hope, as an ordinary frame, something not especially controversial, nothing even in terms of intellectual architecture novel. This is a familiar frame for anyone who's gotten economics training, that when we get private investment, in the marketplace and products begin to roll out, consolidation sometimes of market power begins to happen, the, the rising use of some particular product then often brings about some negative consequences. When we have negative externalities, there's a potential role for regulation to internalize those ex externalities in order to diminish the negative use cases, the unintended consequences, while still keeping the great benefits. We're, we're gonna offer you a frame for thinking about a variety of different decisions about technology through this language of negative externalities. I'm going to begin by giving you the sort of three-part the, th the three-part diagnosis in the book of what's gone wrong. What is the system error? We want to make every effort we can to communicate that what we see that's happening is not the product of a of a bad person, of a badly motivated person. We don't want to say that Josh Browder is somehow um, ill-informed, badly motivated. Sam Altman, the same thing. We want to communicate something about a system of incentives that is in place that produces reliably the outcomes we get. Don't fixate, in other words, on Elizabeth Holmes of the world, people who break the law. Fixate instead on the system structure of how it is the technology is developed and deployed. So part number one of that diagnosis is to start with the mindset of technologists themselves, and that mindset is of a relentless optimization approach, not merely to technology, but to the world as a whole. And optimization, despite the kind of self-given um, impression by technologists of it being a superpower, if you can optimize something, that makes everything better, is actually, in our view, a potential liability. Because, here's I putting on my philosopher's hat, I think the important thing to understand is that optimization, efficiency, maximization, these are means to accomplish some end. 
And if you don't have a complementary portfolio of skills to evaluate the worthiness of the end you're trying to optimize, if you optimize for something bad, you can make the world worse, not better. Optimization has to be seen as a strategy for getting you to a goal, but you have to be able to have confidence that the goal itself was worth pursuing in the first place. Um, to put it in slightly wonkier language, efficiency, maximization, and optimization is a derivative value, not an intrinsically good value. It only becomes a good thing to optimize if the thing you're optimizing for is independently worthy itself. So the basic spirit here is to say there's three different problems with the optimization mindset. First, you can get the choice of bad goals or objectives. If you optimize for something that's objectively bad and increase the efficiency of the production of that bad thing, you make the world a worse place, not a better place. Now, uh, I don't think that's frequently the case with technologists, although it is something to be aware of. The much more common problems are the second and third issues with optimization. Number two is that when you take a large and general mission, take Facebook's mission to connect the world, or take, take Google's mission to organize the world's information, to try to make that computationally tractable, to try to create a technological solution to that interesting mission, you need to create what, are, what a technologist would call some representationally adequate, computationally specifiable version of that mission. You need to reduce the grand mission to a set of tractable proxies. And it's a familiar problem with economics that if you begin to strive to accomplish a proxy rather than the main goal, incentives organize around accomplishing the proxy. And if the proxy is distant from the main goal, then you organize yourself to optimize for something that's far short of your mission, and you forget because you had to work with this computationally tractable thing. We give an example in the book that you might know of. In 2018, I think it was, there was a memo uh, released from Facebook at that point by one of their chief strategists that said, at Facebook, we strive to connect the world, and the way that we measure that is by growth and engagement on our platform. Even if people do bad things with Facebook, even if terrorist uh, um, incidents happen because we connected people, still we strive for more growth and more engagement because this is our measure for whether or not we're connecting people. Again, that's the sense there about the problem of finding a proxy for a good goal. The third reason, the problem of multiple valuable goals. Let me ask here, this will be a difference between Washington, D.C. And, um, and Silicon Valley, I predict. How many of you have enjoyed a Soylent lunch anytime recently? How many of you know what Soylent is? Yeah, most of you. Soylent is a meal replacement powder. Many of the things that technologists try to solve for can be solved successfully for a particular goal, but if socially what we care about is a balance of goals, a balance of objectives mixed together, the successful optimization for one thing can upset a greater balance. Why do I mention Soylent in that regard? Soylent, is pro the product is described as an optimal replacement for the body's nutritional needs. The actual website says food is an inefficient delivery vehicle for what the body needs. The value of food, of course, consists in cultural identity, social connection, pleasure in eating. Um, if you have Soylent alone, you're going to lose out on those other values, even if we're charitable in thinking that Soylent optimizes for the body's nutritional needs. Many products have this flavor. Optimizing for one thing successfully, even if that thing is objectively good, like the body's nutritional needs, comes at the cost of other values that also matter. So that's the problem with optimization. Second part of the diagnosis. It's the venture capital funding structure of tech companies in which there's a, you know, a, a desire to have a unicorn. You try to scale something as quickly as possible. Um, what you do is you try to lock in your market position, get that classic hockey stick of growth. And if there turn out to be socially unintended consequences, you mop those up later. First, you try to lock in your market position. You go for scale, hyperscaling, blitz scaling. And only downstream do you try to hire for people that are going to try to anticipate socially unintended consequences, begin to mitigate risks. The venture capital structure puts a premium on scaling as quickly as possible, getting a unicorn status, and later on dealing with potential problems. And then finally, third part of the diagnosis is the longstanding regulatory oasis produced by Washington, D.C. here. The decision not to, not to try to put in some ordinary guardrails. These days, the conversations about AI 
have the following flavor, I'm trying to introduce basic common sense ideas. We don't let cars on the road without some basic safety standards. We actually expect industry norms as well as regulatory arrangements. We don't put milk or meat on the grocery store shelves unless we have some inspection regimes for it. We don't allow drug discovery to take place in people's garages so that you tinker around with some lab set and then sell it to the neighbors down the street to see what happens to them. Why should the release of super powerful technologies like artificial intelligence be any different? A common sense approach to thinking about basic safeguards. Well, in Washington, D.C. in the 1990s, there was a decision to put a regulatory oasis around Washington, D.C. The inventor of the internet here, you all know him, Al Gore. We can eliminate many of the regulatory barriers now in the path of the information superhighway, perform the most major surgery in the Communications Act since it was enacted in 1934. That's what led to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act that was passed in 1996, the famous provision now that immunizes from liability any social media or internet company that hosts user-generated content in any form or fashion. That was the policy decision that accelerated the development of Silicon Valley. But now that we've reached a moment in time where these negative consequences, these negative externalities are so apparent, a regulatory oasis is no longer a wise approach. So the next part of the book, the second part of the book takes you through four different kinds of technological questions where instead of just thinking technology good in this case, technology bad in another case, we face and confront value tensions or trade-offs between rival things that we care about. And the technologist whose mindset is an optimizing mindset wants always to think that there's a correct answer, a uniquely optimal solution to something is often flummoxed by the idea, familiar to economists, familiar to any human being about their whole balance of their lives, that there are value tensions to be navigated. So, for example, in algorithmic models, whether they're in hiring or credit scoring or in criminal justice or wherever they happen to be deployed, we worry and familiar, we're familiar these days with various questions about bias. bias. Can we get increased accuracy in the model and what happens if we're also trying to solve for algorithmic fairness, algorithmic explainability, algorithmic due process? How do we ensure that we get the maximum accuracy in a model as possible while also ensuring we get um, a, a bias diminishment, we get various forms of due process and explainability in the meantime? We give a variety of examples in, in, in the chapter about algorithmic bias to show how this has worked in practice. A famous example about Amazon doing its very best effort to build a hiring tool for its own company since they were trying to hire so many thousands of people a year, in which they found they could not eliminate a bias against hiring women from their own hiring model. And so they eventually scrapped the algorithmic model for hiring at a certain point because they couldn't determine how to eliminate this persistent bias. Ways in which algorithmic decision making has to confront these kinds of value trade-offs. Another chapter focuses on various questions about data maximization and privacy issues. So many of the debates about the internet these days consist in the data abusing practices of either internet or social media companies that in exchange for offering us a free product suck up all of our data. And then various invocations of privacy guarantees, whether it's from a company like Apple, privacy by design, or whether it's, a, say, a messaging app. You know, you probably have in your, your phone right now either Signal or WhatsApp or some type of end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app. The tensions here between things like guaranteeing privacy, let's call this an objectively good thing, but not the only good thing. Guaranteeing privacy can come at the expense of national security or personal safety. Signal is a fantastic technical accomplishment, this end-to-end -end encrypted technology, which guarantees not only that the government can't inspect your message, but neither can the company itself. The signal has been used for child pornography, for organizing the January 6th um, insurrection, all kinds of problems with the use of the platform for using these private messaging um, um, services. If you ask Signal, why do you get to decide the balance between privacy and national security and no one else has a say, their answer will be, we just think privacy is really important. That's what we care about here at Signal. On these larger social questions, confronting these value trade-offs about how much privacy, how much national security, how much personal safety, these are social questions that deserve wider input. Another one which is also a frequent topic of conversation is the deployment of automated systems. These are frequently these days AI systems, but they needn't only be that, whether it's automated vehicles, various forms of robotic um, um, solutions and factories. How do these automated systems interact with human well-being? 
in the chapter about automation, we point to two particularly important trade-offs. The potential for extraordinary increases in productivity through automation at the expense of both human material welfare, which is to say simply jobs, income that come from the jobs that people have and that might be either transformed by or displaced by the machines, but also, and importantly, human agency itself. The value that we as human beings attach to our own exercise of our agency to deliver certain outcomes. You probably have a grandparent where if you've communicated to them how in the near future it's possible to have an automated vehicle fleet and construct roadways in a certain way in which it's going to be massively safer than humans who drive cars. And that there's gains for across a whole variety of places, less traffic, less emissions, much greater safety. And you're gonna have an uncle who's gonna say, I don't care because I want to have my hands on the wheel with my foot on the gas pedal driving down the road. It brings me pleasure. Let me have my agency. And you multiply that across a whole variety of different fields. Some human beings will feel that the trade-off of their own exercise of their agency against a variety of productivity gains and safety gains won't be worth paying. And we'll have to confront those value trade-offs too. Finally, there's a chapter on perhaps the most familiar of all of the trade-offs, free speech in an online digital public sphere. How do we balance the interests of having an information ecosystem that is not filled with pollution of misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech? with the ability of people now at unprecedented scale to express themselves and to reach an audience through these online mechanisms we have. We rightly want to have an attachment to freedom of expression. That is an objectively important value. But so too is a healthy information ecosystem. And if you have an amplification system now driven algorithmically for engagement that incentivizes the production of extremist information, of misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech, because that's what generates engagement, we have another value tension to confront. This is gonna be all the more true with these AI-driven tools that will pump automated information into our digital public sphere at a new scale. So these four chapters take the initial diagnosis of the system, optimization, the venture capitalist funding, obsession with profit maximiz maximization and hyperscaling, the policy oasis from Washington, D.C., map it onto four different domains in order to identify what the value trade-offs are and how to confront these with a variety of different solutions. In the book, we have a whole variety of proposals about how to manage these trade-offs and to think about changing the basic systems arrangement. I'm gonna turn the floor back over to Jeremy um, for the last bit of the book and where we are today. So an important thing to consider about the moment at which we wrote this book is that people found themselves looking at this balance of extraordinary benefits of new technologies and this emergent view of these negative externalities, and people felt largely powerless to think about the consequences and what to do about them. In essence, the operating view at the moment was one in which technology washes over you like a wave, uh, and there's not much you can do about it. You want the benefits, you want these extraordinary returns that come with new technologies, you have to accept all the costs. And this is a mindset that we wanted to go straight after in our teaching, in the work we do with professional technologists, and in the book itself. Um, because one of the myths of Silicon Valley is that we can't really know the consequences of technologies when we design them and build them. That there's no way of identifying what some of these potential harms might be in advance. Um, and this gives us and gives industry the license to move forward with deploying products in the world uh, without any effort to think about those consequences or how to mit the, mitigate them in advance. And we think while that may be true under some conditions, some second and third order consequences that can't be evaluated or can't be seen until a technology is rolled out at scale, we think it's mostly not true. It's mostly the case that when you're designing a product for the world, you have to make all sorts of consequential decisions about how you design it, how you set up its interaction with human beings, what kind of policy environment you think ought to exist that either enables the technology or mitigates some of the harms. And in fact, when you integrate the thinking of computer scientists with the thinking of social scientists, we can be in a position where we anticipate potential impacts, we measure those impacts empirically, and we think concretely about how we can influence and shape 
the effect of technology on society. This may seem obvious today because it's the conversation we are having about large language models. It's the conversation that we're having about AI. But it hasn't been a conversation that we've had about technology for much of the last 25 years. And part of our message in the book and part of our message to students and to all of you is that the effects of technology on society are ours to shape. And by ours, we don't just mean people who are working in the policy sphere. We mean this for our young computer scientists. We mean this for those who are financing companies uh, from Sand Hill Road. We mean this from voters and consumers, that ultimately we have something at stake in how we referee these value trade-offs. And for much of the last 25 years, we've left the refereeing of these value trade-offs to those who run the company, seeing this as not something that merits public attention and debate, and transparency about how these decisions are being made. Now, in many ways, that serves the motivation of our largest tech companies, right? When tech companies are at the table talking about the potential harms that we've shared today, their first orientation is to say, well, all of you are consumers. And if you don't like the impact of technology on society, don't use our product. Just opt out. But the challenge when it comes to externalities is that you cannot opt out of the consequences of social media platforms on the health of our information ecosystem. You cannot opt out of the implications of gig work platforms on the financial burden that falls to the federal and the state government for people who don't have a set of basic protections around their labor. You don't have the ability to opt out of the consequences of labor displacement as it might require major investment either in income support or retraining. And so just walking away from new technologies as a consumer doesn't enable us to deal with these externalities. Now the book talks at various different places and we can come to some of this uh, in the Q&A about what we might call point solutions. What do we do about data privacy? What do we do about algorithmic auditing to deal with bias? How do we think about retraining? These are all point solutions to some of the challenges that each new technology presents. But the broader frame of the book built around the system error is to say that we see with each technology the repetition of a dynamic of the realization of extraordinary benefits by scientific advances and the monetization of those scientific advances through our robust private sector, but then the development of these externalities that go largely unaddressed. And we see that as a system error that requires a set of systemic solutions. Um, and so think about the roadway system. We roll out cars. It's an extraordinary intervention in the world. It changes where we can live and where we can work. But we don't encourage everyone to pick which side of the road they drive on. We don't encourage people to drive as quickly as they want when they go by a school, if that's their preference. Right? We set in place some guardrails to the introduction of this new technology, recognizing that it might have potential harms. And we offer a frame that says there are three core elements of a systemic change that we need to contemplate that go beyond the point solutions of the moment. The first is that we need to think about this new field of computer science uh, and the engineers that both build products and manage companies as developing a responsible professional ethos, a code of conduct, an ability to self-regulate their own behavior because of course, Disruption is always going to move at a pace faster than democracy can move. And ultimately, we contrast in the book the emergence of a set of professional norms around the biomedical sciences, and in particular, the other consequential technology of the most recent decade, the development of CRISPR and gene editing. And think about all of the elements of professional norms and social sanction that exist in the life sciences all the way up to formal modes of government regulation. But it begins with the self-policing that happens among scientists and among companies themselves, the standards to which they hold themselves. And when you contrast that with computer science, where ACM, the, the community of computer scientists, has a weak code of ethics, no IRBs exist uh, that really exercise insight and, and control over issues and, and projects around data science, and of course, no regulatory body. So this is a vastly underdeveloped space, even when it comes to not government action, 
but social coordination among technologists about how to referee these value trade-offs and to balance the benefits and harms. The second element is to think about the concentration of power that has emerged in a small number of very large tech companies. This issue is again on the table as we think about potential proposals for regulating AI, but a world in which consumers demand and want variety in privacy policies, in content moderation policies, in AI tools that may be tested or evaluated in particular ways that might manage some of these downside consequences, a world in which it's so hard for smaller companies to enter these spaces that are largely dominated by a small number of companies is one that justifies the intense focus that we have on antitrust concerns in the present moment. And then the final piece of the puzzle, and this is something that I think all of you can appreciate, is that we can't make progress on these issues in the absence of having a government that is capable of evaluating concerns related to new technologies and thinking about the appropriate balance between policies that promote innovation and policies that protect consumers and society more broadly from a set of harms. And I don't think you could find anyone who would disagree with the argument that we don't have this government now. And part of the argument that we make in the book is that we don't have this government for a reason. That is, we have not designed a pipeline of people into our governmental apparatus with the appropriate incentives, the appropriate positioning, the appropriate salaries to enable us to build out the scientific and technological expertise that we need in Washington. And in fact, we've done the reverse. We've stripped our government of scientific and technological expertise over the last 30 years. And that's a story that we tell. So as we come to the Q&A, we find ourselves at a fork in the road. When we wrote this book and it came out uh, for the first in hardback about a year and a half ago, the last chapter of the book, How Do We Build Democracies Capable of Governing Tech, opens with the story of large language models before anyone was focused on them. We said, this is the example of the next frontier technology that's going to raise these value trade-offs and going to demand a response from society to this moment. And today we find ourselves at this fork in the road. And people are waiting for Washington to act. Because Europe has acted. Europe passed its AI Act. And Europe has been developing its AI Act long before large language models were on the table. And they've adopted a risk-based approach, rooted in the precautionary principle, with an orientation towards transparency and testing and tracking for algorithmic decision-making and AI-driven tools that might have significant consequences for society. How are they going to do this? We still don't know. But the framework, the articulation of a framework is already in place. Yesterday at CSIS, we got a speech from Senator Schumer, an articulation from the perspective of the majority leader, but trying to reach out broadly to both sides of the aisle. We're going to need to establish a distinctively American view about the appropriate strategy for regulating artificial intelligence, large language models, and the like built around a set of principles. These principles are principles we've seen in, in the AI principles of companies. We see them in statements of the G7. But what does it mean to make these principles operational? That's the question for all of us on the table. And really, the next step in this opening policy window about how we seize the benefits of these new technologies, but also mitigate the harms and begin to address the system error that has given us these repeated externalities over time. Thank you. Thank you both for um, writing this book because it was, an, I got the early edition, so apparently I have a whole other chapter, so I'm going to have to read the other book that no, you no, had. No, this is still, it's still good? Still the eighth chapter. Okay, right. I, took, I, I read it with lots of notes in mind, <coughs> but uh, one of the things that you started with is optimization. Yeah. And um, one of the challenges of being in Washington, as you both have spent time here, is regulation, right? Yeah. Those two things don't normally blend together. And then on top of that, um, I spent a lot of time in the internet governance world from the beginning. In the very beginning, I'd always be challenged with, well, how are the zeros and ones supposed to know about humanity, right? You're just right. thinking about it from an engineering perspective. And so as I was reading this, I was thinking about where can we try to land on regulation where we can encompass a lot of what you focus on in this book. And I've really come down to, you talked about data maximization in the privacy. Um, 
I always say it's, I don't really believe in privacy, it's a feeling, um, so, but, but data is something that we can regulate. So data governance seems like a good place to start because I think we've got both the lawyers and the engineers both understanding the objectives. Uh, then we have the, the question, which I, it's interesting as I was looking to see the Schumer, and I'm you know, gonna ask you about this, but you know, do, how can we continue to keep the verticals which have more security measurement to them to the horizontal that we're seeing Europe do, which is they kind of throw everything into the basket. And sometimes I think that's not the best way to do something because we end up with either something too strong or too weak in the process. So um, how do you, what do you think about that? Like starting as data governance is maybe our point here in Washington because we gotta start somewhere. Yeah, can I start on that? So I just want to, I, I want to sort of emphasize the way you began the, the, the question there, Shane, about um, this mismatch between regulation and optimization. So one of the stories that I didn't mention just, just now, but is in the book and, and was really a big awakening for me. So yeah, I, I have basically oriented my life as a political philosopher around thinking about democracy as theoretically, and then as a comp an issue of measuring the performance of democracies. And I got invited to this dinner in Silicon Valley by a bunch of um, venture capitalists and technologists of some of the names you would recognize. And um, we were seated. The person who had invited us said, the topic for conversation I'd like to have at this salon table tonight is to imagine what it would be like if we could find a place of, on Earth, a piece of land that we devoted to the maximal progress of science and technology. And the guy across the table raised his hand and said, Sergey, Larry, and I have specked it out already. <laughs> and went on from there. And about 15 minutes into the conversation, I said, hey, you know, excuse me, professor over here, can I just ask, is this a democracy that we're, we're discussing here, this plot of land? And the answer was, no, absolutely not. Democracy holds back the pro progress of science and technology. This has to be a beneficent technocracy. And my response to that type of view of optimization as something to apply to the world at large is that you, you technologists are fundamentally misunderstanding what democracy is for in the first place. Democracy is a certain type of technology itself, an institutional arrangement for confronting persistent disagreements among citizens who are equal. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an institutional design for compromise and negotiation that treats people fairly in some form or fashion. If you look to democracy to optimize some social output, you have engaged in a category mistake. Don't think that you should get optimal results from democracy, they're better for other reasons. And so I think that mismatch is, in certain respects, really profound um, between the optimizing orientation of the technologist who actually doesn't attach value to democracy itself at the end of the day in certain cases because it's a suboptimal arrangement to them in certain ways. All right, on data governance, um, within that as a, as a way of thinking uh, about um, how it is that something that's in the interest of certain kinds of technologists can map onto a regulatory approach. Um, yes, I think you're right that the, um, the kind of initial foray into this, into this arena by, by Europe and the GDPR various forms of data management, data governance, um, that, let's be honest, take the kind of weak form of dealing with notice and consent by all these pop-ups we get whenever we're browsing the internet about what our cookie settings should be. Um, we're trying to explore data governance now not as a matter of individual choice. Let, let's choose my data settings and, and, and preferences that might, be, might maybe follow me across the web but rather something that we position at a social level about who owns the data, under what circumstances can it be granted to other people, under what circumstances can it be aggregated and then analyzed around various prediction machines. I think that is a place to start where it will um, limit the basic fuel of how computing itself operates and so will shape all of the downstream choices about um, not merely the development of new technologies and their deployment, but also begin to orient if the United States or any other place goes in this direction, some understanding about data as a right for individuals or a social guarantee, um, but I think that's still an untested proposition. GDPR is just the initial way to orient ourselves towards thinking that the, this basic just suctioning of data can't be the healthiest approach of all. So um, I haven't given you a, 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 like a particular plan, but I'm agreeing with you that it's a ripe place to begin. Let me just add one thing to, to Rob's comment, which is to say, um, of course, one of the central challenges in regulating data access or data governance is that data is the fuel for the advances in technology that we're experiencing in the current moment. It is also the fuel for the extraordinary profits 
that the large technology companies have reaped that not only have made people extraordinarily wealthy, but also fueled reinvestment in this technological growth. And so policies like GDPR or the various bills that continue to be introduced in each Congress run into the challenge that they threaten the core business model that has enabled the tech industry to emerge in the present moment. And it's a reason that why we, we think of privacy as this low-hanging fruit that people would like more transparency about how their data is being used. They'd like the ability to move their data with them as they go from one platform to another. They'd like to know when their data is being sold to a data broker. These seem like commonsensical kinds of changes, but contrast those kinds of commitments to people's rights to their own information uh, with the current framework that we have. Rob referenced this as notice and consent. Notice and consent is effectively that moment when you download an app and it asks you to accept the terms of that app and you have to scroll down through something which you cannot even read or understand if you spend time reading it. It's not written in a language uh, that is designed to facilitate your own understanding of the end use of your data. So the situation is really tilted in the direction right now of sharing everything, right? And facilitating all of the potential end uses to power new technological developments, to enable the reselling of information, to facilitate all sorts of personalization of advertising, because big tech is largely uh, the most effective advertising model that we've ever seen. And so in that sense, it's no surprise that while privacy feels like the low-hanging fruit, uh, we see very little progress in passing the privacy bills. We get them every year, but they don't pass. I'm, I'm thinking we're at a time now in the economy where we, we need to get there because of cross-border data flows. I mean, it's interesting because there, some places like Africa is very far behind, but they're so far behind they can just leap ahead because they just don't have, they're like, we don't have that much data. We don't have that much money to spend in the market, right? So we haven't been there. We're watching Asia come more online with that. And I've always been a big proponent that I'd like to see um, terms of use em emojis. So I'm like, here are the five things that I care about. And if one of them's missing, I either say yes or no to it. And maybe AI will get me there faster now because I'll be able to pick that. But um, so then my second part is um, knowing, so Schumer this week, you know, coming out with the SAFE Act, SAFE stands for, and this is a favorite Washington game, right? Like figure out what you want to say and then figure out the words that make it into the acronym. Or figure out the acronym. And then figure I, out I'm the pretty words. sure that the acronym Game was person. a longer f oh. duel in the room, from what I've heard, than what the entire operation <laughs> oh, might be. But oh. um, secure <laughs> accountability, foundations, and explain are the simple ones. You had it on the yeah, screen there, yeah. but do, you, do yeah. you think they nailed it? How'd they do? I'll offer a first comment on this, which is um, I think what we're seeing from Congress is the beginnings of uh, a conversation where we're gonna try and find our way to a bipartisan path uh, on a set of initial regulatory steps. And what I see from the SAFE innovation framework is largely a set of high-level principles, uh, which a lot of folks who have concerns about this next moment in AI are gonna see themselves in some aspect of this. Now, of course, innovation is the one that didn't make it into the acronym, um, but Senator Schumer spoke about it yesterday. It's not safe I, it's safe and innovation. Um, and I think innovation is gonna continue to be a priority both for the Democrats and the Republicans. That is, the fuel of our continued economic growth in society is gonna be successful advances in AI, um, and, and our technology sector is a comparative advantage for the United States and the world. And so the focus on SAFE is gonna to have to be balanced in important ways with this innovation agenda. Um, but what you see in this framework is attention to adversarial uses. You see in this framework attention to concerns about bias and discrimination, concerns about the lack of transparency around models um, and the potential harms that might be caused by models without an existing liability regime in place, and the concerns about copyright as that relates to the data that fuels the models. Um, and you see you know, this attention to some of these rights that we talk about in algorithmic decision making, the right to ability to understand when the models are being used and, and how the model is making a decision, a justification that you might expect from a human being but you can't get from an algorithmic model. But these are all at the level of principles. These are, this is not a regulatory model. This is a framework 
to begin the conversation. And I think what we heard from Senator Schumer yesterday is the need to initiate a robust conversation, a process of self-education among members of Congress, a conversation that exists across party lines and between the legislative branch and the executive branch that has to, in some sense, wrestle with the question of whether the initial regulatory play that we've seen from Europe, which is built around the precautionary principle, built about around risk assessment, how does this relate to a distinctly, as Schumer described it, American model of approaching artificial intelligence? And we've got lots of technical documents. We've got the AI Bill of Rights from the Biden administration. We have the NIST, the NIST framework around uh, risk mitigation and risk management. And then, of course, we have what we've seen from Microsoft, what we've seen from OpenAI, what we've seen from Google and others. These principles will not seem unfamiliar to anyone operating in any of those spaces. But they don't yet answer the questions about, you know, what is the transparency testing and tracking regime? Is that done by government? Is it done for every kind of product? Is it done before something is released in the world? Uh, or is it only done once we see harms develop? Um, these are kinds of critical design questions on which at least what we've seen so far from the safe innovation framework doesn't yet speak. Well, I want to pick up on this thread. Um, I feel like somebody needs to defend big tech. So I'm going to be that person. Okay. Uh, and, I'm a and person in the yeah, exactly. <laughs> and somebody needs to defend optimization. Um, I, I would dispute the idea that we are in some sort of oasis or wild west situation as it relates to regulation of the US economy, including high tech. Mm -hmm. uh, we have vast, we have vast systems, bureaucracies, extensive law, regulation. Uh, there are many, many different ways to address harm now, right now. The, li the list is very long. So this idea that somehow, you know, um, uh, big tech is out there operating completely on its, uh, or, or any tech, whether, you know, we've got an awful lot of small tech moving right now too, uh, out there moving without any kind of uh, constraints or oversight just doesn't seem realistic to me. I think that we've got a, we've got extensive uh, extensive oversight. That's part one of the statement slash question. The, the second one is uh, the precautionary principle that you were talking about um, cuts both ways, right? I mean, it isn't just the harms that we are avoiding with our precautionary principle. We are inflicting harm with our precautionary principle. Uh, and this is particularly, it's evident in many cases, but it's particularly evident in health. Um, we had a, um, a physician who do, uh, at the, from the Cleveland Clinic who manages all of the, um, all of the, uh, the standing up of artificial intelligence platforms uh, for clinic activities. She took that job just a few weeks before COVID started. Uh, and uh, because the national health emergency had a lot more latitude to do what needed to be done in order to serve patients. And I will just add mainly minority low income patients who were being affected by, um, by the pandemic. She's looking at, at what she's done on that, Dr. Jehai. Uh, she's looking at it and saying, we could apply all of this to diabetes, to kidney disease, to high blood pressure, to every chronic health condition that is plaguing the American public, and we could improve outcomes. But we can't because the thicket of regulatory authorities is already so substantial that our legal team just won't sign off. Okay, so what, what am I missing there? It seems like we have an already pretty heavily regulated situation. Why do we need more in advance? I'm not saying, you know, harms occur, we respond to harms, maybe the law doesn't take into account uh, a certain case and we need an amendment to the law. Uh, so 
why why the precautionary principle? You want to start with the precautionary principle? I'll take on the big tech thing. Um, well, I think where I was going to start was to say the health example that you picked mm -hmm. speaks directly to a space where constraints on access to personal information are significant and mm -hmm. highly regulated, mm -hmm. right? And so this is absolutely a space where the potential of learning and powerfully affecting people's health via the use of algorithmic tools or AI-driven tools is running directly into a regulatory arrangement around access to people's personal health information that has deep roots in law, right? And so when we think about the challenge of enacting electronic medical records and building these systems, the challenges of data access and data sharing across hospital systems, between hospital systems and academia, between hospital systems and private sector companies, this is a space which I think is different than other spaces in big tech, where you're absolutely right that having optimized so far for privacy, which is maintaining for all of us the ability to own our medical records and all of the information about the treatments that we've received and how our body has responded, uh, is coming at the cost of what you described from the perspective of this doctor in the Cleveland Clinic, which is that this doctor looks at this situation and says, I can be a social planner and a social optimizer. I can make everyone's health better off if you're willing to give me your data. And I say, let's have that conversation in our democratic institutions. Is this a time to revisit the way in which we have approached electronic medical records and health information? Because there are good reasons that we set in place the prior regulatory architecture. Why? Because when you apply for a job, you do not want someone looking at your medical files to make a judgment about whether you should be hired and how much they should invest in your training over time as they think about whether they're going to get a return on their investment in you. That's just one example of the kind of discrimination that has led us to embrace privacy. But as we think about the precision medicine moment that we're in, you're absolutely right to say that a precautionary principle frame, which doesn't think about the opportunity cost of going slow, or doesn't think about the opportunity cost of potential benefits, uh, is probably going to miss the boat. Can I jump in right there? Though? I mean, so it's, it's more obvious in the health case. But it is not, it's not obscure in a lot of other cases. I mean, at the broadest level, uh, the estimates of the potential benefits, say, this is just the economic side of the, you know, the growth in GDP and productivity and so on, we only get that by going fast. If we don't go fast, we don't get it ever, right? So the precaution, again, the precautionary principle of trying to limit harm is, it's the harm, uh, it's the harm shaped as the good that never occurred. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what I'm uh, at. I, I don't think it's just limited to health, although I, I, I take your point that you know one of the reasons is that we've done a pretty rigorous job of regulating health information. I think everybody mostly is glad about that. So, But maybe we shouldn't yeah. be so glad as part yeah. of your point. But let me make one other point, and then I'll yeah. hand it to Rob, which is to say, you know, the precautionary principle is the European approach, right? Mm -hmm. And the question for us in the United States at this current moment and part of what we suggest in the book is that um, the front line of responsible AI is going to be inside the companies themselves. Mm -hmm. That has got to be central to our strategy. And it's going to be not just company by company, but it's going to be the development of a set of industry-wide practices. And we already see the, the kind of seedlings of these industry-wide practices. Each of the companies are talking about them, responsible AI approaches building it into your production process, red teaming your products, thinking about unintended consequences of what you build. Um, that kind of ethos of professional and social responsibility in technology companies that we see in the life sciences is the first and most important place to start because there is no way that we can achieve our innovation goals with an orientation towards new technologies which says stop and don't do anything until we can put this through a multi-year process of testing. And I don't think that that's where we're going to end up. I don't think that's realistic given the kind of value trade-offs uh, that, that we care about. 
But that said, should we have a conversation in our politics about whether there are a set of sectors or a set of potential use cases where second and third order effects or potential adversarial uses justify a, go or, a going slower mentality, um, that's the conversation that we are just beginning to have about AI. And I think that conversation makes sense given the power of these models. Let me try and hop in here. I want to say two things, but I'm going to try to um, um, say something on behalf of the precautionary principle, just, just to test the waters in a way that's not hypothetical, but I think true to the, the debate with AI these days. So first, it's certainly conceptually possible that the healthcare arena is overregulated and the AI or tech arena is underregulated. So um, I think I'm likely to sign on to some, some statement of that sort. I, in addition to Section 230, in addition to a whole variety of statements in the 1990s about deliberately trying to pave the way for America to win the information superhighway race, um, to small things like um, EULAs, the end use license agreements that we sign for software. Um, our, our colleague Meron often gives this example um, in classes that, you know, like, if you're a civil engineer and you build a bridge and the bridge falls down, you can lose your license to practice and you can be sued. If you're a medical professional and you do something that violates either you know, basic standards of practice, again, legal liability plus you can lose a license to practice. Microsoft sells you Office and included an end use license agreement is you agreeing to, even if the underlying software in Excel that computes things mathematically turns out to have a flaw and it miscalculates something systematically, it's not responsible legally, financially, or otherwise, it's all on you, basically, by signing the license agreement. The immunization of even kind of ordinary consumer protections there strikes me as the developmental immaturity of the, of the kind of professional space that, that technology has long existed in. Okay, on the precautionary principle. So, you know, I don't know how widely this is discussed in Washington, D.C. circles, but one of the things which is always lurking beneath the surface in Silicon Valley when it comes to AI conversations is the presence of effective altruism and the kind of orientation towards existential risk that um, large language models, foundation models might pose us. And the kind of thing that, you know, I think a Sam Altman might say, possibly sometimes in public, but certainly um, people from open AI or anthropic and private is, Look, uh, these large language models, we're not even aware of what the capabilities of them are. We're developing them as quickly as we can. They're gonna have extraordinary benefits, but one thing we're worried about is whether or not these could be used in the kind of drug discovery mode to build novel pathogens. And if you just open source them to the world and allow people to play with them, democratize AI, you're basically giving a, you know, a free pass to anyone to tinker in their garage with bioterrorism. Um, that sounds really dangerous. Dear government, wouldn't you like to have a licensing and registration regime? I'm just rehearsing Altman's points here. Um, does that type of precautionary principle arrest your attention in a way to feel like there are some genuine concerns? I, I think any time that you talk about uh, somebody cooking up uh, pathogens in their, in their garage, you, you will get people's attention. And this is something I wrote about recently, which is this negativity bias that we have yes. toward, toward technology. Uh, we are much more afraid of what we are going to lose than what we might gain. And my sense is that given that underlying, I think it's genetically selected, uh, evolutionarily Kahneman reinforced. Kahneman and have taught us this. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, I think uh, given that bias, that that's our real problem. Yeah. You know, not, I, I mean, uh, I grew up in the era of disaster movies, you know, like the Poseidon Adventure and right. the Towering Inferno and, and Jaws, you know, and all these things. It's like, those things don't happen, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that Those are Hollywood generated yeah. figments that take advantage of this, yeah, this, fear. Uh, this fear that we have. Yeah. So we can't make that right. the basis for policy. And unfortunately, I think that's where we're headed right now because the entire conversation is focused on risk. Mm -hmm. What are the dangers? What is going to be taken away from me? What am I going to lose? And uh, very little time given over to what are you losing by not doing it? Mm -hmm. yeah. so let me ask you one follow-up yeah. on this because I read your piece on the negativity bias and I want to ask you, 
is this a description of the current moment? Or would you say the negativity bias has characterized from 1993 to the present? Because I think the negativity bias characterizes today. As we walk around in this town, people have discovered large language models, and they are freaked out. I mean, they're also really fun, and people are using them mm -hmm. to write rap lyrics for their partner, right, in, in, the, in the style of Snoop Dogg or whatever it might be. But aside from the fun, people are freaked. And, and it doesn't help when you get resignations of the leading AI scientists who basically say, I am scared about what I have built and the consequences for the world. And people say, well, I don't know anything about what these things are, but if the person who built it, like people who created nuclear weapons, is walking around saying this could potentially destroy the world, then people have that negativity bias. But I wouldn't say, I mean, I'm interested, do you, do you have the view that the negativity bias characterized the first two decades of tech? Because I think it's quite the opposite. Okay, so, uh, I mean, I remember, I was working in the Senate at the time that we got internet access. Mm -hmm revolution it was it was so fun you know uh, there was no more waiting on CRS to send you the policy brief there was no more some you, interns have no idea what yeah you're yeah it doesn't matter just trust me it took a long time and it was frustrating and uh, and 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 then we had the internet and it was it, you know go go it was wonderful you know and you're right there there although I I do remember and I've seen, I've gone back to look like at the view, the YouTube clips of like news broadcasts talking about the internet, and there was some of this negative. Oh, this is weird. You know, I'm just not sure that this is a good idea. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and and so there was some of that negativity bias. But I think what happened isn't. We didn't go from uh, from 1993 to 2023. We had 2007, 8, 9, 10 in there. Uh, in which we also got social media. And that, I think, has been the conditioning event for the way that we're trying to think about AI. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I, I'm going to join you here. If, if you're willing to accept that that early era, let's call it 1990s to late two early 2000s, um, was a period of techno-optimism. It was almost all upside. Um, in, in our teaching and in the book, we use these lines. Um, Ronald Reagan said in the, in the 1980s that the, the, um, the Goliath of totalitarianism will be taken down by the David of the microchip. Um, his successor, President Bush, said that, um, imagine if the internet took hold in China and how freedom would spread. Um, there was this belief in something about the inherent property of digital tools and technologies that made them somehow liberatory or unleashing of human creativity. And then we got the huge backlash because of social media, awakened that there were these negative externalities in the language that we use, we use in the presentation. And what I, what I wanna think is that we're, we're finally entering a period where we see this within the scope of technological innovation and scientific discovery over a long time horizon, and how we needn't attribute uniquely optimistic properties or views to it, nor uniquely pessimistic views Let's treat it as negative externalities that deserve an opportunity to try to use the ordinary tools of regulation as well as self-government self or self-industry you know, um, no, uh, norms in order to get the benefits and contain the risks. Like in that respect, no rocket science involved here and entering a moment of ordinary politics is a really healthy sign. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree, I agree with everything. And else. workforce, which is one of the issues that you focus on, is a perfect example of where what we need are ordinary politics, right? What we don't need at this current moment is to look at AI and say jobs are gonna be erased because we know over the long historical durée that the labor market adjusts over time, but that there is some delay in that adjustment and some people benefit disproportionately from the changes and other people are harmed and that you need a set of investments to facilitate that kind of evolution. But are we having a conversation about what those investments well, we, are? We are. I can't speak for everybody yeah, else, right. but we are. Yeah. But that's exactly yeah. the kind of conversation that we need to be having yeah. in the Senate and the House and with mm -hmm. the White House, because ultimately that's the normal politics of adapting to this new technological frontier. I want to give Shane a chance to get in here with another Sorry, question. Clarification. It was Rick Boucher, who is a lovely former congressman from uh, Virginia, who allowed the internet to become legal outside the U.S. government, not Al Gore. 
People love to give Al Gore way too much credit for that. Um, so uh, the other thing is, I'm here for the machines. Like, think about APIs. You know, it's it's we have. I think that the learning language models are really cool. I'm having a lot of fun with them. But it's it's like when people first had to figure out how to attach themselves to the bigger tech industry that was coming along and do all the cool things, all the apps that are on your phone. I mean, imagine probably half the room here don't really sit in front of the computer most days. They're just sitting in front of their mobile device, which I can always tell when you guys are sending me stuff that you don't understand that. But um, that's, <laughs> it, it's, it, we're having, a, I think, a net positive moment. I mean, I, 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 this whole idea of like the machines are gonna kill us, I keep reading the articles going, God, maybe we deserve it. You know, I mean, it's, um, <laughs> But they, uh, but the internet, I think, is a very much a mirror of society, and so I think that is part of what we need to put into our process on this: is what is it that we are so fearful of that we think the machines are going to reflect back upon us that we need to be thinking about, and you know, the, and the guidance we might need is psychotherapy, not um, necessarily better coding, or maybe they go together. Uh, but going back to because we still have Schumer here on the screen, one of the things I loved about his announcement was just wanting to avoid Congress altogether. Mm -hmm. When he just said, let's get a bunch of smart people together, hopefully smart people, in a room this fall and start thinking around this. And he didn't call it all the magic words that we call things in Washington. You know, we just said, let's, let's try to figure this out and then move it forward because Congress has never gotten around to it. And the first thing Congress did was they had a hearing today. They were like, no, we are going to be in on the game. So I think um, we have a lot to look about in this space. We, we mentioned it, but I think it's worth going back to is what about the, the hit the pause button? Mm -hmm. You know, is it was that a bunch of people that are really fearful or was it a bunch of people that, ha that the, this came out faster than they thought it was going to and they were not in the game fast enough. And so they, you know, they have the ability, they're running their own operations to hit the pause button if they're worried about that. That kind of befuddled me a little bit. Yeah, I, I think the, that petition, which you know garnered whatever twenty thousand plus signatures, um, um, not something I I would have signed or would have wished to have gotten as much attention as it did. But if I want to be as charitable as possible to the, some of the people who were the initiators of it, um, one of the things that I think is a very important difference to mark between the social media age of Web two, um, where, where as Brent said, we began to you know, have the tech backlash and all kinds of concerns, and the current moment is that a large number of the people, the scientists uh, building these models and, and the people who work in the organizations have this effective altruist orientation. And so they're concerned with what they would describe as the existential risks introduced by runaway or malevolent AI. And the pause was an attempt, I think, for people who are close to the technology, so these aren't outsiders, um, but rather technologists themselves, trying to convey um, a kind of an alarm bell for the, for the rest of the world about the potential power of, of what's advancing more quickly than people even inside the community, technical community, believe would have been possible just a year ago. And if there's even a few you know, kernels of truth to the idea that we're on the brink of accomplishing artificial general intelligence, sparks of AGI, as the Microsoft document um, called it, then confronting and grappling with the significance of that is certainly worth somebody's attention. Why don't I think the pause letter was a good idea? I mean, the simple answer is that the people who are responsible actors who might have been persuaded by or already felt um, um, something about the document and then internalized it um, might have slowed down. And those who don't care at all had no reason to heed it anyway. So it was, it had the perverse incentives of, as it were, slowing down the already responsible people and giving a green light to those to gain you know, various forms of competitive advantage to those who were never going to abide by it in the first place. So a, a kind of simple petition and letter, I would have rather have seen behind the scenes closed door forms of kind of, you know, track two diplomacy, let's call it, rather than a kind of public letter. Maybe the best we can hope from it is an alarm bell was, was sounded about the potential of AGI. But there, I think we're in the realm of unfalsifiability. I don't want to call it science fiction. I just don't say, I just, I just don't think we have any empirical basis by which to make a, an honest assessment of whether that's true or not. I just want to add two comments on this. I mean, the letter itself is a strategy, um, but let's think about what might be the underlying motivations behind this. And so, you know, we might talk about explainability or interpretability, 
part of what we know from AI scientists closest to doing this work is that getting their head around why models are doing particular things and what the potential power of these models is something that they can't even get their heads around. And that level of uncertainty and discomfort that many of our colleagues who are on the front lines of doing this work feel is what justifies a step for many of them like the resignation that we saw from Google or a letter like this. If you, if you can't even understand what the model is doing, that it is so beyond human cognition and capability that it surprises you with responses that it provides or steps that it take, takes, and you can't even figure out how to tune it this is what the sparks of AGI look like. And a warning shot to those who are not paying attention from those who are in the companies and those who are closest to the science saying, hey folks, this is beyond what we think we can understand and handle, I think is an important signal for everyone to wake up and take some time. The second piece is that we've done a bit of a historical tour here through tech utopianism and to the tech backlash. And I'd also suggest that part of what we saw with the letter is learning some lessons from Web 2.0. Learning some lessons about when and under what conditions it might make sense to take some time to think about second and third order effects, to red team unintended consequences, to think about design choices. And this all happens against a backdrop of an economic contraction in tech in which many of the people who were laid off were the responsible AI teams. That's something that we know. We know those individuals. Those teams were gutted in the most recent round of layoffs. This was before ChatGPT, right? And so the architecture that was being built up in the boom time to do the kind of responsible AI practices that ultimately are going to be necessary was being eviscerated at a moment of economic contraction and anxiety for the companies. And so I take this as a signal both of how challenged they are in terms of understanding the new technologies, but also concerns that the industry's ability to manage this on its own is not really in place. Okay, I want, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. But I want to give the audience a chance to get in, and I want to give first, right of first refusal to our senior fellow in science policy, Tony Mills, who's uh, been watching to see if he's got a question that he wanted to answer or ask. I do actually. Okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry, thank you. Um, so thank you, uh, Tony Mills, I'm a senior fellow here at AEI. Um, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I have two questions that kind of pull in, in different directions. So on the precautionary principle and on the point about knowable harms in advance, um, I, the question gets to, to linking that discussion up with what we were just talking about. Um, so. It seems to me that a lot of discussions about AI regulation going on right now, um, highlighted by the letter and other kinds of high profile conversations, the kinds of risks that we're talking about are um, existential type risks, which have the characteristic, as you say, of being perhaps not falsifiable. I would describe many of them as science fiction. Um, this seems like a very different kind of scenario than one where we can say, look, well, there are some obvious kinds of harms. We can think about design choices. These seem like kinds of risks which it's impossible to refute, but the stakes are so high that to defend not doing anything puts you on the side of wanting to be in favor of human extinction. Right. This seems to make it very difficult to have a reasonable, deliberative conversation about risk. Yeah. So that, that first question is, do you see the conversation about AI governance as a counterexample to what you were describing with trying to identify risks. And then the second question relates to sort of more identifiable risks. So we think about using foundation models to, to genetically engineer a pathogen, right? That seems like a clearly identifiable risk, one that uh, you know, worries me. Um, but of course, we can already do that scientifically, technologically. Um, uh, and we also don't really have a good model for governance of that. Uh, dual use research of concern. There's a whole sort of array of scientific technological developments which we don't really know how to deal with. We have a kind of patchwork, regulatory, non-regulatory, self-regulatory uh, structures that try to deal with it. We don't deal with it well. If it's the case that AI tools are adding more capability to do those kinds of things, how do we 
what's the model for thinking about that government? I mean, we are we going to try to solve that problem by building on a new regulatory structure, which even though we can't already solve this first problem, so I'm just I'm, I'm curious <laughs> concretely what what we can do about that. Um, all right, let me take a crack at, at this, and I know Jeremy's going to want to add something too. Um, uh, let me just use some of the language of the people who invoke ex ex existential risk, language that I myself am occasionally inclined to, not because I think existential risk should be in the foreground of our minds, but because I think this is the way to shape one particular version of the debate that's live right now, is whether the closed, the closed models of OpenAI, Google, Microsoft, um, as opposed to the more open access, open source models that are on Hugging Face or, or, or that Meta uh, is releasing, how should we think about those pathways in the marketplace dynamic now um, in which there's an open, open alternatives and then cl closed alternatives? So if you're worried about things like creation of pathogens and you, you have in mind the kind of thing where this is akin to nuclear, um, um, uh, the nuclear age or um, uh, um, the, you know, bioengineering um, in, in the form of adversarial actors. You don't want to democratize access to uranium and plutonium and tell people to play with it to explore the capabilities. You don't want to say, let's open source the smallpox genome, now kept in a small number of laboratories across the world for scientific purposes, and say, like, have at it in your garage with the CRISPR kit, and maybe we'll find something good. Um, you like to have these things um, um, limited in access and with some regulatory controls around them. Now, of course, everyone's going to point out that, well, AI is not like um, in the nuclear age. It's not as if we have scarce resources. I mean, computing resources are, are in certain respects scarce, but not like um, uranium and plutonium. And um, it's not as if we have a, a kind of laboratory structure across the world with some loose coordination around, around things like smallpox or other, other kinds of diseases. So we have to deal with the particular you know, facts on the ground as they present themselves to us. And you're, you're gonna find this either inadequate or a way of restating your basic premise about we just don't have the mechanisms in place at the moment to address some of the, the existing harms, much less confront these things that seem potentially science fiction. Um, but nevertheless, if they're real, they ought to command our attention. I, I just want to advert to the idea that Computer science is a young field, came into existence only in the 1950s and 1960s. People who studied artificial intelligence have only acquired power in the world in the past 20, 20 or 30 years. And so compared to biomedical research, compared to nuclear science, um, AI is developmentally immature. Um, the provocation I offer to computer scientists is to say, you're like 19-year-olds who are newly aware of their power in the world, but your frontal cortex is massively underdeveloped and you're a bunch of socially irresponsible people. Can we accelerate to your late 20s as fast as possible, please? And that might happen through a combination of various regulatory threats, or at least a, a, an, the announcement of a regulatory presence, and the concentration of the mind that could be brought about by responsible actors who want to confront possibilities of bioterrorism or whatever the case may be. So in that respect, I want to lean on the idea that over the course of time, it's natural for things, for professions to, to professionalize. And I don't see any reason we should think that AI and CS is immune from that. Um, do we want to wait for a catastrophe in order to have the right kind of reaction um, in the way that, you know, say in biomedical research, there was a you know, Nuremberg and the experimentations in the death camps or Tuskegee and the responses to, to, to that. Well, it's not a logical necessity that we have to wait for catastrophe, even if socially that often is what happens. So I would, I want to put a lot of energy into the professionalization of AI science, AI development and deployment that I think will happen in relation to a policy window that's opening. Do I, would I predict extraordinary success? I don't think I'm that optimistic. But I think it's a natural progression for the, for, the, for the field to professionalize far beyond its current immaturity. What I'd add to that, and, and I think even your reference to dual-use research of concern, is in some sense a recognition that there are spaces that have approached the, the sort of oversight and responsible management of technological frontiers in ways with a level of nuance and attention 
to potential harms and unintended consequences that's far more mature and fully developed than what we see uh, with the AI frontier. And you know, part of that is the practices of scientists themselves in the life sciences you know, that begins with concerns about you know, RNA in the 70s and Asilomar and the gathering of that kind of expertise, but then takes its form in professional associations, scientific associations, scientific norms. You know, my view is that there is no silver bullet solution to this. There's no, the EU AI Act does not solve this problem. And if people do, then they haven't thought through any of the kinds of complexity and nuance that we're talking about today, both balancing in the direction of innovation while being attentive to these risks, but also the serious operational challenges associated with any regime that even is designed to bring transparency. Bring transparency about what? At what time? Transparency about the existence of a model or how the model works or what generates the kinds of predictions of the model. What does testing look like? Who does testing? Testing internally, testing independently. These are all hugely consequential issues. But I think what I'd say to you is that there's no perfect solution out there, but we're at the incipient moment of beginning to build out an architecture that traverses industry and government and that has to grapple with the question of what is our social objective as a democratic society with respect to these new technologies and what kinds of inputs do we need that will facilitate not just concerns with existential risk, which aren't the ones that animate the two of us and Maron in particular, but the more near-term risks uh, that we can anticipate, that we can see down the road, that we know might be amplified or enabled by these technologies so that we can continue to preserve the space for the kinds of economic growth boom that we can expect from this while also maintaining the political support uh, for this industry to thrive. I think that's a great place for us to end the conversation because I, I agree that when we get out here, that's where catastrophizing happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's too close, then we're being irresponsible, right? But getting into these near-term issues where we can see things and asking ourselves not just should that be regulated, but what are our options for doing that? What are our options for protecting the public? It may be the CRISPR model of like, look, you guys, this is dangerous. You need to figure out how you're going to regulate yourselves on this. It may be uh, uh, that you know lawsuits and and other regulatory actions can occur that can address that. Um, so I I think that that's a really smart way to to think about this. Is let's pull the, our time horizon in mm -hmm. rather than getting it way out here. So a round of applause, please, for our panelists. It's absolutely fantastic. And please, if, you're, if you want a copy of the book, they're available. And um, thank you for coming. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much. Thanks.